let's talk about this. This is something I haven't had a chance to discuss yet with anyone um, on the show. So you've looked a bit at some of these data dumps from Pfizer, right? And you're saying that you're, you're seeing things there that are highly problematic. Um, what have you seen in there that you feel is you know, the, the most egregious? Well, the uh, table with the 11, I think it's nine or 11 pages of adverse events, single line listing, concatenated, separated by uh, semicolons. So these aren't separate points line by line. They are concatenated. So there are multiple adverse events on each line. In and of itself is shocking that this was known, that this is the work product of the pharmacovigilance globally of the Pfizer BioNTech pharmacovigilance team, which just, uh, I know pharmacovigilance is another one of these long technical terms. What, what the, if I can break it down, what it means is that after a product, medical product is licensed, the international standards say that the marketing company, the, comp the sponsor that's, that's manufacturing and marketing that product has an obligation to set up a separate department so it's, it's one of these kind of quality control things where a separate silo is set up for monitoring reports coming from patients and physicians saying that these things have occurred after we have received this product. And they have an obligation, global standards, to follow each one of those reports up which is akin to the CDC's obligation with VAERS, but the CDC doesn't take it as seriously mm. as the pharmaceutical industry has to take it. And so this is the work product from their pharmacovigilance shop at Pfizer BioNTech. And clearly they did not want to disclose this information because they fought hard, as did the FDA, to withhold this information. Most of this information in these disclosure documents were available to the FDA when they made their decision that these were safe and effective vaccine products and they should be fully licensed. So that the table that lists these adverse events in and of itself is stunning. These are adverse events of special interest. They've redacted the information about their frequency. Um, mm. uh, there is some overall tabularization of frequency by organ category, which is the like grossest, highest level summary. Um, they're not giving us the data about their event rate um, uh, for each specific uh, category or, or diagnostic code, which is essentially what all these are, is separate diagnostic codes. Um, then that's, that's one that's shocking. You, you may or may not recall, I think it goes all the way back to our first interview when I was talking about this Japanese common technical document dossier mm. that uh, Byron Bridal had obtained. And, and I spoke about that and, and we both got plenty of uh, pushback from the fact checkers. Back then, I think none of us really recognized that whole ecosystem of what the fact checkers were and what they have become. Uh, but back then, we all took it seriously, and it seemed so unfair. And they were attacking based on things that I had said and Byron Bridal had said when he'd evaluated. We both independently evaluated this Japanese common technical dossier. What we find now with the Pfizer releases is that all that was true and more. Um, so the suspicions that we had that we had inferred because we couldn't read the whole document. Neither of us are fluent in, in Japanese. Um, we could look at the tables and listings that were in English and draw conclusions based on that and the, and the um, footers that were describing those tables, but we didn't have the whole body of the document, let alone have the body of the, the parallel document that had been submitted to the FDA. We live in an era of censorship and disinformation, and it can be really hard to know what's true and what's false in this information climate. To get honest information and insights you can trust, join us on Epoch TV. You can sign up for your 14-day free trial at ept.ms slash freetrialjan. That's ept.ms slash freetrialjan. And just to reel back again in time, I specifically called Peter Marks, hmm. Center, Center for Biologic Evaluation and Research, 
and had a conference call with him. This is before the vaccine licensure or anything else, and said, I was really concerned about these various things that I was seeing. Um, and uh, my concern was that the agency may not have had a full appreciation of some of the subtleties and nuances that I had as somebody who'd been involved in creation of the original technology. And he assured me that um, we now, that we, um, he's speaking on behalf of the agency and the government, now have a much more complete uh, document set from Pfizer, and there's nothing in this is his statement. There was nothing in that that worried him. Now I get to see, we get to see what he was actually talking about. And in fact, everything that Byram and I had observed and more turns out to be true. These were not rigorously uh, characterized in terms of uh, pharmacokinetics. It's another big long word. How long does the drug stay in your body? Uh, pharmacodistribution, where does it go in your body? Genotoxicity, does it impact on your DNA? Um, reproductive toxicology, is it a risk for reproductive health in animal models and subsequently in humans? Now we see from these documents that, that Pfizer knew that it was grossly overstating the efficacy. Hmm. They knew that the all-cause mortality was higher in the treated groups than the untreated groups. They knew that that all-cause mortality was associated with cardiotoxicity. They knew that many of the things that have subsequently come out had to trickle out. We've had to, it's like pulling teeth out of the CDC to get this information, as you know, because they've been so aggressively withholding things. And we've had to go to Israel and Great Britain and Sweden and Germany and UK and Scotland to pull this information and collate it and try to make sense out of it. Pfizer knew all that. Um, so a lot of, I think there are many in the legal profession that are looking at this and um, raising questions about whether in fact this does meet the criteria of fraud in terms of withholding information and whether or not it would break the legal veil that is protecting the pharmaceutical industry from any liability because it appears that they knew of many of these risks and adverse events. Clearly they did. And yet never formally doc disclosed them to patients, which gets to my core, as you'll recall, my original, original pee, you know, under the mattress, the thing that really aggravated me at the start was the breach of fundamental medical ethics having to do with informed consent and the importance of disclosing to patients fully and completely what the potential risks are. And we now have clear documentation that those risks were known, they were extensive, and information about those risks were withheld. And we have that, inf we have that knowledge through the Pfizer document dossier and the documents that are being disclosed. Um, as well as through um, the GAO report, the New York Times report on President's Day, etc. It's becoming more and more clear, and yet the government continues to deny it. The first point in this new declaration is that the you know, universal vaccination should end. You phrase it differently, but I understand that's what, that's what the point is. Um, so presumably, that's because of your understanding of the science among the doctors in your organization. Can you give me an overview of how you reached this conclusion? This is not something we've said trivially or lightly in any way, shape, or form. We recognize that this is going to subject us to all kinds of derision, pressure, censorship, attacks, etc. And you know from my, our prior interviews that I have always been very reluctant to come to a position where I say these vaccines are not indicated for any cohort. Over time, as we've learned more and more about the risks, the adverse events, the all-cause mortality now that's coming out, 